Okay, good morning. Um, so today I want to begin with um, compare and contrast between Putnam and Wittgenstein on uh, meaning. And uh, then we'll go on to look at various aspects of how you might, how to develop Wittgenstein's own picture. So uh, it, it, here's a quotation from Putnam. Um, Cut the pie any way you like, meanings just ain't in the head. Uh, um, really, that could have come straight out of Wittgenstein. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, the style is quite different. Um, but <laughs> he doesn't have um, Putnam's folksy charm. Uh, but um, uh, the message is very similar, right? I mean, um, uh, when Wittgenstein is saying, um, you got a teacher saying, this is water, that's water, that's water, that's water, that's not water, that's not water. And uh, the child has to get what the teacher is after, um, pull it together, grasp the meaning in a flash. And the natural picture is that what goes on in the, is that the child gets the right kind of image in their head. And as a result of that, can go on to say, this is water, that's water, that's over there is water, and so on. Um, and Wittgenstein's point about this is the image does no work. All that happens is that uh, the teacher gives all these examples and then after a bit the pupil works with examples in the same way as the teacher did. The idea of an image in the head, it, it doesn't make any difference to what happens next. It can't uh, his meaning is only explained by what happens in concrete instances. And when you think about what Putnam is saying about uh, earth and twin earth, the message there is really the same. Water means something different on earth to what it means on twin earth. Um, though uh, people are, the Oscar on earth and twin Oscar on twin earth have exactly the same images in their minds. So what's giving meaning to the sign is not the image in the mind. It's something about the context in which the image is occurring. Uh, that was the point about twin earth. It's also the point about brains and vats. If you think about what Putnam says in brains and vats, he says, um, let me see if I can remember, something about an ant with a mental image of Winston Churchill wouldn't be representing trees. Um, no, <laughs> it's a bit early. Let me try that again. Um, uh, yeah, if you've got yeah, uh, if you've got a mental image of a tree, right? That's not you representing trees, just because you've got a mental image with the right pictorial properties. What makes it a representation of trees is the context that the image is figuring in, or if the ant draws something in the sand that looks just like Winston Churchill, that doesn't make it a picture of Winston Churchill because what matters is the context in which the image was generated and there isn't the right kind of causal context for that to be representing Churchill. So Putnam's point there is really, is there a difference between Putnam's point and Wittgenstein's? The negative point about the role of mental imagery in meaning seems to be exactly the same. Is that right? I mean, the, the style is so different, but the message seems to be just the same. Um, so then you might ask, well, what, what is it that Putnam thinks fixes reference? And there seem to be two lines of thought in Putnam about what's fixing reference. One is the causal connections between you and the substances in your environment, what substance it is that you're encountering and responding to when you use the word water or whatever it is. And the other thing is for many terms like molybdenum or elm or beach, you might not be able to uh, differentiate these things very well yourself, but you rely on the existence of experts in your community, and you, they, they um, sort out for you what the word means. So with natural kinds, the picture is that there's an underlying structure um, producing various observable characteristics of the thing. You pick up on those observable characteristics. It's um, wet, it's transparent, it participates in the evaporation, precipitation, condensa condensation, precipitation cycle. Um, it has all these observable characteristics of water, and uh, uh, you therefore use the sign. 
And what you're doing there is responding to that underlying structure. Um, and in the case of a more arcane natural kind, like a molybdenum or aluminum, then it may be that what's going on is that experts pick up on those observable characteristics of the stuff. Experts give it a name. You just get the, the, the word from the expert. You rely on the expert to give meaning to the sign. Um, it happened to me a little while ago. You, 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 you ring someone up and a childish voice at the other end says, Daddy's at a conference on low temperature physics. And um, pre <laughs> presumably you're not dealing there with a 10 year old who knows what, exactly what low temperature physics is. But how should I say, they are, they are operating as a mouthpiece. They pick up the word from other people. And it would be perfectly possible to say, no, that's not right. You know, it's really um, very low temperature physics or high temperature, <laughs> whatever. Um, you can get that. <laughs> Um, okay, so Putnam, on the other hand, doesn't have anything like Wittgenstein's notion of a custom. Um, I can't see that there's anything there that maps on to Wittgenstein's notion of a custom. So that raises the question whether you really need the notion of a custom. I mean, can't these appeals to causation and the division of linguistic labor do the work that Wittgenstein is trying to make? the notion of a custom do. I don't myself see that they can, but the situation is quite complicated. There might be something I'm missing. Um, I, division of linguistic labor first. I really glossed over division of linguistic labor in the class because I can't see myself that it's so fundamental to our use of language. And it's certainly true and important that when we use words, when you use terms like low temperature physics, then there is a generally recognized body of experts on these things, and you give way to them, you defer to them as to what the right use of the term is. But that just presupposes that for the experts, whoever they are, whatever the subject is, for the experts, there's got to be such a thing as going right or wrong. You haven't explained what going right or wrong consists in for them. All you've said is that you'll accept them as authoritative on whether you're going right or wrong in your use of the sign. But there's still the more basic question, whether it is for them to be going right or wrong in their use of the sign. So that leaves us with causal encounters. And the basic problem with these causal encounters with a substance or a person or whatever it is that you're talking about is that it's very hard to see how causal encounters of themselves can be what generate the existence of standards of rightness and wrongness. I mean, just things colliding with one another, things impacting on one another, doesn't of itself mean that there's any right or wrong here. So how can it be that substances or people impacting on my use of language can mean that there's such a thing as going right or wrong here. Dretzky's idea was we can see how a uh, causation becomes something normative, something for which there are standards. If you talk about the biological function of something being to causally indicate the presence of something else. So if, the, if you've got a structure in your brain whose biological function is to indicate the presence of water, then you can make sense of that biological structure, getting it right or wrong when it causally uh, responds to water. But the basic problem there was uh, that point that biological optimality is not the same thing as the optimality of truth. That's to say, what's, do, do I need to go for that? Yes, okay. <laughs> What's helpful for an organism, what's adaptive for an organism, might not be the same thing as getting it right. If you've got an organism in um, a, a water-poor environment, let's suppose you've got an organism in a water-poor environment, um, it might actually be quite adaptive for that organism to get false positives about the presence of water. Right? It will, <laughs> it will keep its spirits up. Um, it will keep it trying even when there's nothing particular to try for, it may help it in navigating around. Um, 
When these examples of thinking you're more popular than you are, thinking you have more control over what you're doing than you really do, thinking the future is going to work out better than it does, what's biologically optimal, what's adaptive, is not necessarily getting it right or getting it wrong. Suppose you're a presidential candidate and um, you're wondering who's going to win the next election. I mean, presumably, uh, uh, there's only one rational answer to have at the moment. Right? One, one of these guys should be thinking, yes, I'm going to win. And the other guy should be thinking, well, looking at it, um, uh, looking at the facts, the probability is I'm not going to win. Right? But nobody for a moment expects that the candidate should really think like that. What you really expect is that they're both thinking, yes, we're going to do it. That's adaptive. Right? That's, all, that's what's optimal. That's what's normatively optimal. So what's normatively optimal for an organism need not be truth. What's adaptively optimal for an organism need not be truth. Okay, I mean, presumably a similar point applies even to humble bacteria. Right, that's what I mean about, it. yeah, that some, <laughs> some kind of optimism might be adaptive for many, many animals in many different situations. So biological optimality, look, it looks like there's a difference between biological optimality and the optimality of truth. And um, once you take that away, and you try and do something more austere, like Fodor's causal asymmetry theory, then um, it's very, you're just left with a pattern of causal relations, and it's very difficult to see how a mere pattern of causal relations... Uh, you remember caus causal asymmetry? If the, if the one causal connection hadn't existed, the other wouldn't have? Sorry? The high pressure, low pressure, exactly, yeah. Do, do, do I need to, should you do that again? Horses and cows and all that? Do, okay, you, yeah, you got enough of that, okay. Um, so there you've got a, a counterfactual relations between causal connections, but that's all. And how can a mere set of uh, counterfactual connections among causal relations constitute the existence of standards of right and wrong? So I think Putnam's, uh, I mean, Putnam and Wittgenstein share the negative point about images, but I think, so far as I can see, Putnam's uh, 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 appeals to causation and division of linguistic labor give out on you. So I think we have to look at Wittgenstein's notion of custom or practice. And it looks like the idea of the notion of custom or practice is going to explain how there can be right or wrong in your use of a word. But then the next question is, how does that work? What is a customer practice? How does that? What are the mechanics? How does that explain the existence of standards of rightness and wrongness in the use of language? Um, and also looking at Wittgenstein, he never actually, you have to acknowledge that he never actually frames it like that in terms of explanation. So I just want to raise this, there's a background issue here, is that even the right question to be asking? That may be the wrong question to be asking in the text. Okay. Okay, so that's how I think Wittgenstein and Putnam connect. Strong agreement and a negative point, and Wittgenstein's promising something more than Putnam can deliver on the um, positive picture. Are we all comfortable? <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean physically. I mean, are, you, are you mentally comfortable? <laughs> are you intellectually comfortable? Is that okay? Okay. 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 There's, I just want to go over something I touched on fairly briefly last time. This distinction between semantic, thinking of meaning in terms of semantic value and thinking of meaning in terms of use. Because in the face of it, that's a big contrast between... Um, Putnam and indeed everyone else we've looked at on one hand and Wittgenstein on the other. So there's a general notion of semantic value. The semantic value of a term is how that term contributes to determining the truth or falsity of any sentence containing it. So for a name, the semantic value of the name is... What is the semantic value of a name? Yeah, the object. What object? Right, the object it refers to. Yeah, what he said. 
right? Yes? What is the semantic value of a predicate? It is a mapping from objects onto truth or falsity. So if you've got a ne, if you've got a sentence, Raleigh smokes, and you know what Raleigh refers to, you know which object, and you know what uh, function from objects onto truth values uh, smokes, um, is, is the semantic value of smokes, then uh, you, uh, then you have determined the truth or falsity of Raleigh smokes. It will depend on whether that function maps this object onto truth. Yes? Okay. Um, this is really, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, this is really so important. I think this is the center of most, many philosophical questions. Um, so I just want to take this quite slowly. We had this last time. Suppose you say girdle refers to girdle, and is human is true of an object just when that thing is human, then the semantic value of not is given by the truth table. Okay, this is your opportunity to pause if you think this is not quite clear. That um, The reference, the mapping from objects onto truth values and the truth table, they're all parallel to one another. And they're a little bit different because when, you're, when you have a sentence like Gödel isn't human, then the referent of Gödel in some sense is what you're talking about. The semantic value of is human isn't usually what you're talking about, though it can be the topic of the sentence. The truth table of not is never what you're talking about. You see what I mean? So, um, I mean, you, if you wanted to talk about the truth table, you'd have to get a name for the truth table and refer to it, yeah? Uh, just the mere fact that you're using the word not in a sentence does not mean that you're talking about a truth table. So there's a notion of what a term is about that is different to the notion of semantic value. And these three things are all very different when it comes to, when you ask questions like, what is the sentence about? Um, but if you just get this abstract conception of semantic values, how the term contributes to determining the truth or falsity of a sentence containing it, then um, the, it's then when you've got that very abstract conception that you see the parallel here. This is really important. Is the parallel clear? What could be clearer than that? Okay, suppose you want to explain the meaning of and. How would you explain the meaning of and, class? Truth a truth table, yes, <laughs> very good. Okay, so um, this is a little bit fancy, right? For not, it's just two lines. Here is four lines. I hope I've done this right. I always, <laughs> I always make mistakes with the truth tables. Um, yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> Gee, yes I say that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so if they're both true, then A and B is true, and if only one of them's true, or if they're both false, then A and B is false. Yeah, so that's a map from truth values to truth values, and uh, that gives you the semantic value of and. Now, on the face of it, that talk about semantic value is exactly what Wittgenstein is throwing out. Um, it's very natural to think that's how you know the meaning of and, you know the truth table, yeah? Uh, that's how you know the meaning of Gödel, or you know the meaning of his human. You know the semantic value. That would be the thing that tells you how to use the term in particular cases. So that if you know what that map is um, from objects onto uh, truth values for his human, then when you're confronted with something, when you're confronted with a chair and asked, is that human? then what you do is you consult your knowledge of what the map is and then you see if that thing gets mapped onto truth or onto falsity and uh, then you give your answer. So the map here will be like the thing in the middle, the thing that, uh, that like the mental image, it will be the thing that you measure the object against to see whether it satisfies the predicate. Yeah? It will be the thing in your head, the rule that you use to determine whether or not the word applies to the thing. Similarly, your knowledge of uh, the semantic value of girdle, girdle refers to girdle, that will be um, uh, the thing in the middle that when you encounter something and you, you ask, is that girdle? Then uh, uh, you'll, you'll consult your knowledge of the reference of the sign to see if the thing in front of you is that reference. Um, and Wittgenstein's point is that isn't uh, that that notion of semantic value is the thing that does no work. 
There's only your applications of the word in particular places. So if you're explaining the meaning of A and B, it would be better to forget about the truth table and just look at the rules of inference for A and B. So what is the introduction rule for A and B? What is the introduction rule for and? If you get A and you get B, then you can draw the conclusion A and B. I, I, don't, say it, I don't say it's that deep an insight, but, um, but that's what it is, right? And what is the elimination rule for, a and, for, uh, for and? If you get A and B, then you get A, and if you get A and B, then you get B. So that's a pattern of use for A and B. And that's a different thing to the truth table. And in Wittgenstein's picture, it would be better to say you learn the meaning of and by learning the pattern of use. You just do operate in this way in particular cases. This, just, this in fact, is how you do reason. That's all the hard fact about the use of language. If you look at what someone is doing in their use of and, that describes what they do. That describes their custom of using and. Um, and this thing is just idle. If you forgot about this thing and said, well, let's just stick with the pattern of use, you'd have all the facts. So all that, uh, all that work you did in truth tables was really beside the point, right? Because all that really is is the pattern of use. So, if you could, so is that clear that that will be what replaces the talk about uh, truth tables and Wittgenstein's account? Yeah? This is your chance to protest if this is not completely. Some of you look extremely puzzled. Yeah, yeah. So, is that, is that not to say that the truth table is false? Is that you don't really, it's not really what's figuring in? Are you That's right. It's not, it's not to say the truth table is wrong. It's just to say it doesn't do any work in our understanding of the sign. Once you've got an understanding of and, you might draw up a truth table. But the great mistake is to think that the truth table is fundamental and you can derive your use of and from it. Yeah. I mean, actually, in this case, we, when we talk about um, adding one or water or the, these other examples we had or having an image of blue or having an image of a, a cube or whatever, then is, in a way it's relatively informal that you can't derive the use from that knowledge of semantic value. But in this case, there's really something like a proof of this. Because suppose you didn't have any patterns of use for logical signs. Okay, suppose you, you got and, or, if, then, the basic logical signs. And uh, uh, you don't know any of this pattern of use. All you know is the truth table. So suppose you've got truth tables for all your basic logical signs. Are you going to be able to derive the pattern of use from that? It should be able to do it. Yeah, uh, how would that go? Uh, right. Isn't that intuitive? I agree that's really intuitive. You should be able to think, well, if you get A true and B true, then you get A and B. So that will give you the introduction rule. Uh, yeah? And if you've got um, uh, A and B true, then you must have A true and you must have B true. So since when you get A and B true, you must have A true, you can get the first elimination rule. And since when you get um, A and B true, you've got B true, then you get the second elimination rule. Yeah? So th th I just derive the rules of inference from the, semantic, from the semantic value. That's the way the classical picture says it should go. Yeah? You, you know how to apply the term because you know the semantic value. Yeah? You know how to apply the word girdle because you know what it stands for. You know how to apply the word water because you know what it stands for. But listen to what I did there. I just said, um, I said, if you've got A and B true, then you've got A true, and you get B true. So I just used some rules of inference. I used the rules of inference for if then. Yeah? And, when I, and I said, if you get A and B true, you get A true, and you get B true. So, you get A true. That's using the elimination rule for and. 
Yeah? And when you think about it, there isn't any way around that. Because deriving is using inference rules. Yeah? So that's using rules like this. So in order to derive anything from this, I'm already going to be using the inference rules. That's just <laughs> a brick wall. There is no way around that. Yeah? Um, so the most you could hope would be to fiddle about with which particular inference rules you're using. But in general, if you take all the logical constants simultaneously and say, I got all their truth tables, if you took a child that was incapable of logical reasoning, didn't have any of the principles of use for the logical, of logical particles, and you said, there you go, there's all the truth tables. Now get on with it. You couldn't do it, right? Uh, yeah, if that was your position, you'd be absolutely helpless. So in this case, the Wittgenstein's general point can really just be proved. You can't, in general, derive the pattern of use from the semantic value because the pattern of use um, is required to do the derivation. Yeah? Okay, you can pause me at any point. Okay. Okay. Um, so, when we're, if we're going to replace the talk about semantic value here for Gödel and for his human by something like this, yeah, then what we would need is something like, instead of Gödel refers to Gödel, you'd have something like, in these circumstances, say, Gödel is F, when you're presented with a bespectacled sinister mathematician who um, proved the incompleteness of arithmetic, say, that's Gödel, right? Gödel is smoking a pipe. But, yeah, that's just the basic rule. And if you accept Gödel is smoking a pipe, you can conclude from that something like, there must be um, a mathematician who proved the incompleteness of arithmetic smoking a pipe. Something like that. So the inputs and outputs for your use of the sign will replace that talk about semantic value. Yeah. So we really throw out everything we did in the first part of the course. And uh, I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> there you go. But the new course will throw all this out too. Um, no, actually. <laughs> okay? Okay. And similarly for is human, you'd say, is human, instead of saying is human is true of an object just when that thing is human, instead of specifying the semantic value for the sign, um, you'd just say when you'll use it in these circumstances, when confronted by this kind of thing, say X is human. And on the other hand, uh, the elimination rule will be if you accept X is human, then conclude the circumstances must have been H. However exactly you specify what should trigger your use of the term human. And there is a, 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 a question here about how you formulate these patterns of use. You see, it's very easy here to give a concise statement of what the pattern of use is. Um, it's not easy here to give a concise statement of what the pattern of use is. But presumably, I'm not sure about this, but presumably in both cases, something like Wittgenstein's general point will apply that your understanding of what this pattern of use is has to be explained by reference to what you do in particular cases. That's to say, if you were had to explain to someone what these general schematic things mean, you'd have to say, well, for example, if I say Raleigh smokes and Isaac fishes, then I'll conclude um, Isaac fishes. Or if I know Isaac fishes and Raleigh smokes, I'll conclude that Isaac fishes and Raleigh smokes. So you just have to give examples. And that will be true, presumably, for these cases, too. You just give examples uh, to explain what the general schematism means. So presumably, these p formulations of patterns of use will be subject mm -hmm. to Wittgenstein's point that they can only be explained and understood by giving examples. Here ends the second lesson. So that was yes.
That was a yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're not meant to be just writing down my answers, though. <laughs> my, my task is to formulate the problems. Your task is to sort it all out. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> did I get it wrong after all? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just wondering about someone who says that all we actually need is to understand that people will tend to make inferences according to whatever will preserve the truth and falsity. According to? Whatever will preserve the truth and falsity of. Uh, That's right, yeah. Well, I don't really see how you're going to do the derivation without, uh, I, I mean, there's got to be something important and right about the idea that the truth table uh, shows how these rules of inference are truth preserving. Yeah, the truth table just spells that out for you line by line, how this trend, and I mean, this is the simplest example you could possibly have, yeah, but uh, for any even more, much more complex examples, the same general point is if you get truth at the inputs, you get truth at the outputs. Yeah? Um, but Wigisain really throws out that insight, it seems to me. He doesn't leave you any way of acknowledging that that's an insight. And the argument is um, if you just say schematically, uh, I want my rules of inference to preserve truth, yeah? in a particular case, You've got to do the explanation for why these rules of inference preserve truth. And in giving the derivation, in giving the explanation, you will actually have to use lots of principles of inference. I mean, the simplest thing to begin with is you're going to have to say, if you have A and if you have B, then you can conclude A and B. So or, or going back to the truth table, you'll have to say, if you have A and if you have B, well, let's look here, I've got these both true, then from the truth table, see, oh, it's all that if-then reasoning. So you're just using the rules of inference for if, if-then, yeah? Um, I mean, another way to put it is, you know the story of um, Lewis Carroll's, the, uh, what is it, the um, Achilles and the Tortoise, yeah? So Achilles and the Tortoise run a race, and um, Achilles crosses the line first, and Achilles turns to the tortoise and says, look, I won. And um, uh, the uh, tortoise says, no, I don't see that. You didn't win. And Achilles says, look, I crossed the line first. And the tortoise says, yes, that's right. And Achilles says, well, if I crossed the line first, then I won. And uh, the tortoise says, yes, that's right. And Achilles says, so I won. And the tortoise says, no, I, I don't really see that. <laughs> and um, so Achilles says, look, here's the truth table. I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but Achilles, <laughs> Achilles says, look, here's a truth table. Look, so you accept, well, uh, the, the truth table for if then. Picture, if you will, the truth table for if then. Yeah. And Achilles says, look, um, um, I crossed the line first, right? And it's true, also true, and the trotter says yes. And Achilles says, so it's also true that uh, if I crossed the line first, then I won. And uh, the trotter says yes. And Achilles says, and look, here's the truth table. And the tortoise says, yes. <laughs> and um, uh, Achilles walks through all the lines. And uh, uh, the tortoise says, yes, to all of them. And then Achilles says, so I won. And the tortoise says, no, I don't see that yet. <laughs> um, and the point is that if you don't get the rule of inference, then no amount of assenting to the truth table you know, Achilles keeps saying things like, well, look, logic will take you by the throat and force you to accept the conclusion. And the trouble is it really doesn't. Right? If you think of logic as a truth table, unless you already get the rules of inference, the truth table can make you do nothing. The truth table is silent, really. Yeah? Right, so, yeah, I mean, related question. We're not, um, when we're taking the pattern of these to be basic, we're not taking that to be somehow prior We are taking it to be prior to explaining the truth conditions. That's what I mean by taking the pattern of use as basic. This talk about truth, 
And Wittgenstein's picture, as, as I read him anyhow, yeah, I mean, all this is up for negotiation, but as I read Wittgenstein, his picture of truth is, of the notion of truth, is that it's completely peripheral to any discussion of understanding and meaning. Um, if you want to say what truth means, it means something like this. You've got a sentence P, then P is true, is the same thing as saying P. And that's it. It's not an explanatory notion. It's the best a notion you might use when you can't be bothered repeating the whole of P. Yeah, um, as you, you know, someone makes a comment and you say, yeah, what he said. You, you, you can't be bothered going through the whole comment yourself. Yeah? Or if someone makes a comment and you say, that's true. It's just you can't be bothered repeating the whole thing. It's, that's a, it's a useful shorthand term, that, but that's all truth is. Yeah? There's nothing fundamental about it from the point of view of understanding and meaning in this picture. So that's the same thing as throwing out the truth tables as basic to an understanding of the signs. Saying that A is true is just another way of saying A. Yeah. Okay. okay, so what's a custom then? If we've got the patterns of use, and we want to say the patterns of use, you can go right or wrong in your use of a sign, then um, what do we get from Wittgenstein and what a custom is? Um, I'm just going to, I, I think all I can do really is give you a sense of what he means by custom. I think it's very tantalizing and is not a properly spelled out notion. If language is to be a means of communication, there must be agreement not only in definitions, but also, queer as this may sound, in judgments. And you'd naturally think with language, look, all that matters is that we all define our terms in the same way. We don't have to agree about any particular case so long as our definitions of the terms are all the same. Um, and his point is, if you think about something like the example add one, we really all got to agree in the particular examples before we can be talking about um, taking the successor of a number at all. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't make sense of everybody agreeing on the definition of add one, but disagreeing about whether three comes after four or four comes after five. Your understanding of add one only comes because we have all our agreement on the particular cases. You naturally think of semantic value, as, um, as uh, someone just said, giving a foundation for your use of the term. And here's him stating the general negative point here. How am I able to obey a rule? If this is not a question about causes, then it's about the justification for my following the rule in the way I do. And if I've exhausted the justification, then I've reached bedrock and my spade is turned. When you ask, why do you derive A from A and B? You can't appeal to a truth table to explain why you do that. You just do it. The best you can say is, this is simply what I do. Or you might say, this is the way of my people. Um, and that's all you can say as to justification. Justification stops at a certain point. It stops sooner than you might have expected. Um, I have, um, well, yeah. It is when I obey a rule, I don't choose. I obey the rule blindly. And the idea of, how should I say, sighted following of the rule is that you see the thing, you see what kind of thing it is, you match that up to your knowledge of what the term stands for, and consequently you apply the term. That's a natural way to think of working with a word like red. You know what red is, you've got the image in your head, you see the object, you ask, and you, you see it and you say, is that red? And then you match it up to the image in your head, and if it matches, then you say, yes, that's red. Um, and the point is to throw out that kind of image of what's going on when you say that something is red. All that happens is you see the thing, and you say, that's red. There was no, vision didn't, there's a sense in which vision didn't really come into it. We, we talked about these passages a little bit last time, is what we call obeying a rule, something that would be possible for only one man to do, and only once in his life. Well, no, because you don't have a background of definition or semantic value. You've only got a pattern of use. And you, it doesn't make sense to talk about a pattern of use being exhibited just once. As your time is getting short, so I'm going to... Um, the, 
w when you think about how he's using um, the notion of custom, it connects up to something like our form of life, to ways of using terms that we could pick up from each other, part of what Cavell called our whittle of organism. So it's natural to think, well, um, what is that? How, 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 do, how do we make more explicit what he means by the whirl of organism within which we have customs or practices? To obey a rule, to make a report, to give an order, to play a game of chess, are customs, uses, institutions. To understand a language, understand a sentence means to understand a language. To understand a language means to be master of a technique. So the kind of analogy you might have here would be someone like a carpenter using a chisel. It's not that you need to have in your head, a good carpenter needs to have in their head, a whole bunch of rules for using a chisel. It's that using a chisel is part of mastery of a whole bunch of tools, and the ability to use those tools isn't to be explained in terms of you being able to say or having some images as to what you do. It just is being able to use them well um, in context. This, uh, there are two really tantalizing examples here. One is, th 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 think about this case. It is, of course, imaginable that two people belonging to a tribe unacquainted with games should sit at a chessboard and go through the moves of a game of chess and even with all the appropriate mental accompaniments. So you, you come across these two guys in a clearing in the uh, jungle and they're at a chessboard and they're making, they come from a people that just don't have games and um, they're going through all the motions of a game of chess and they even, as he says, have all the mental accompaniments. One of them is saying, yes, yes, he's on the run. The other one is saying, oh no, boy, am I in trouble. Um, they have all the mental accompaniments. If you were to see it, if you just wandered in upon this scene, you would say they're playing chess. But I take it the point here is the lack of a context means that they, they couldn't be correctly described as playing chess. This is not part of a general custom, what they're doing here. And a way to see what is wrong with taking it to be part of a general custom is to say, um, imagine a game of chess translated according to certain rules into a series of actions which we do not ordinarily associate with a game, say, into yells and stamping of feet. You could do that, right? You could just translate the game, each move in the game, into a particular kind of yell, a particular kind of stamping of your foot. And I suppose that what happens is you come upon two people in the clearing yelling and stamping in pl uh, 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 instead of playing chess. And you say, look, um, I've got a video. I can do an analysis of what is happening here. And I can translate this all into the moves of a game of chess. It's true these, these guys don't have games in general. They are much more serious than that. But I, I can show you, I can translate this into a game of chess. Nobody would take this seriously for a second. Yeah? The mere fact you could do that, that you'd come upon this shouting and stamping, and you said, I can translate that into chess, that wouldn't make you at all inclined to say these guys are actually playing chess. So if you come upon people making the moves in the board, the translation into saying this is chess is simpler, but it's no more justified to say this is chess. And one reason for saying it's not chess is you couldn't pick up from these, cha from these stamps and yells how you know, other people, other humans could not pick up from these guys how to go on with the stamping and yelling, how to have further games of chess in terms of stamping and yelling. Um, you've got something that with chess we can pick it up from each other. We know how to go on after a bit, just as with learning add one. When you get a, whole, a certain number of examples, you know how to go on. You can do the thing yourself. These guys, if they're stamping and shouting, you couldn't pick up how to go on from them. If humans actually did, did not try, if you had someone who said, let's not play regular chess, let's just do it in terms of stamping and shouting, 
That would not be something that you could teach other humans in the way that we teach ordinary chess. People couldn't pick it up and get the hang of it in the same way. Imagine someone using a line as a rule in the following way. I think what he's got in mind here is something like this. You've got a line here, and you've got a pair of compasses by which uh, it's something like this. Is this right? Is it? <laughs> you, you have to tell me. I think this is some, what a compass is. It's got a pair of, there's maybe a pencil here, and a, 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 a pencil, and um, a spike here. Is that right? That, that's a compass. Yes. So um, uh, you put the uh, spike along here, and you've got the pencil along here. And so someone says, look, this is what I'm doing. This is the way of my people. Here is my, here is my way of going on with a particular example. So he holds a pair of compasses, carries one of its points along the line, while the other one is drawing the line that follows the rule. So this is like the, the rule governing the use of the language, uh, that line along there. And the compass is like, where, where the line is going is like your use of the word in particular cases. But let's suppose... While he moves along the ruling line, he alters the opening of the compasses apparently with great precision, looking at the rule the whole time as if it determined what he did. So you've got someone who's very carefully going along, going like this. Yeah? And, you, and you're saying, yes, look at that, look at that, yes. And he's muttering to himself as he does it. And you say, I, I can't see what you're doing there. Um, Watching him, we see no kind of regularity in the opening and shutting of compasses. Or we cannot learn his way of following the line from it. Here, perhaps, one really would say, he thinks he's got a rule here. The original seems to him to intimate which way he's to go. But it's not a rule. So, a custom is not something where you just have a lot of uses of words in particular cases um, and uh, we've given up the idea that you know the semantic value of the term so you just have uses of the word in particular cases. This kind of thing where someone uses the word in particular cases but you can't pick up from them how to go on, um, that doesn't count as a custom. If instead of saying, if I say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, after a bit, you can pick up from me how to go on. If I shout 97, 3, 400, 21, 82, right? I can do this for quite a while. And at no point are you going to be able to say, ah, now I get it. Now I can go, or rather you might, but <laughs> what you'd have got was that you could do anything you liked next, right? As opposed to zero, one, two, three, or this is red, that's blue, and, and, and so on, when you can pick it up. So something about a custom is, it's not just that um, you've got uses of the term in particular cases uh, and no semantic foundation, is uses of the word in particular cases, and there is such a thing as getting the hang of what someone else is doing, getting the gist of it, so that the thing can be communicated, so that other people can learn from you what you're doing. You need something like that to have a custom. Okay, uh, on um, Monday, we'll uh, look at Kripke's interpretation of Wittgenstein on all this. Okay.